So in this lecture video, we're going to take a look at some of the physical properties of alcohols and how they compare to ethers and epoxides. And then we're also going to look at some of the chemical reactions involving alcohols um, via elimination reactions and some of the simpler uh, reactions involving ethers and epoxides. Based on the chemical structure of alcohols, ethers, and epoxides, you can see that these organic molecules are polar molecules. And so they exhibit dipole-dipole type of intermolecular forces. And so this also gives them a higher melting point and boiling point compared to hydrocarbons like alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. Alcohols are a little bit different compared to ethers and epoxides in such a way that alcohols contain a hydrogen that's bonded directly to an oxygen atom. And so this allows alcohols to form hydrogen bonds. And because of that, alcohols have higher melting point and boiling point relative to ethers and epoxides. When comparing the boiling points of different types of alcohols, we have to consider their capability to form hydrogen bonds because hydrogen bonding is affected by steric hindrance. The more sterically hindered the alcohol is, the less they're capable of forming hydrogen bonds. So here we have three different types of alcohols. We have primary, secondary, and tertiary. You can see that tertiary alcohols um, are more sterically hindered because they contain three alkyl groups bonded to uh, the carbon atom. And so they are more sterically hindered, which makes them less capable of forming hydrogen bonds compared to secondary or primary alcohols. So here's a table that summarizes and compares the physical properties of alcohols, ethers, and epoxides. In terms of boiling point and melting point, you know that the stronger the IMFs or intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point or melting point. So you would expect alcohols to have higher boiling point and melting point compared to ethers and epoxides. And so you can see here that uh, this diethyl ether has a lower boiling point compared to these alcohols here. And in terms of tertiary, secondary versus primary alcohols, the more sterically hindered alcohol has lower boiling point compared to secondary or primary alcohols. And in terms of solubility, alcohols, ethers, and epoxides having uh, less than or equal to 5 carbon atoms are considered water soluble. And the reason why is because they have an oxygen atom, a heteroatom, capable of hydrogen bonding with water. On the other hand, alcohols, ethers, and epoxides with more than 5 carbon atoms are considered insoluble, water insoluble, because the nonpolar alkyl portion of it is too big to uh, dissolve in water. And finally, alcohols, ethers, and epoxides of any size are always going to be soluble in organic solvents. So here's practice problem number six. Rank the following compounds in order of increasing boiling point. So you can see that we have four different compounds here. We can go ahead and label them A through D. And you can see that molecules C and D here are both alcohols and they are capable of hydrogen bonding. And so in that case, C and D would have uh, the highest boiling point here compared to um, molecules A and B. And so when comparing C and D here, we have to take into account the classification of the alcohol. Do we have a primary versus secondary versus tertiary? So you can see that molecule C here, this alcohol is a primary alcohol because this carbon atom is bonded to one other carbon. For molecule D, this is a secondary alcohol because we have a secondary carbon here. And so in that case, molecule C, the primary alcohol, has a higher boiling point compared to the secondary alcohol. So C is greater than D. And between molecules A and B here, you can see that we have an ether and a hydrocarbon. And so because the ether contains an oxygen atom, this molecule is capable of dipole-dipole type of IMFs, or intermolecular forces. And so it would have a higher boiling point compared to this hydrocarbon molecule B. And so in that case, B is less than A. And of course, A is less than D because we have an ether versus an alcohol. 
And for the second problem here, we have three different alcohols and an ether. And so uh, we're going to have to label these alcohols based on their classification. So the first one here is a primary alcohol. The second one here is one, two, three, a tertiary alcohol. And the third alcohol here is a secondary alcohol. And so, again, we can go ahead and label these molecules A, B, C, and D. So because we have an ether here, this is incapable of hydrogen bonding. So it's going to have the least uh, boiling point. So D is less than uh, B, and B is less than C, and finally C is less than A. So A would have the greatest boiling point because this is a primary alcohol, followed by C because it's secondary, and then B because it's tertiary, and then of course uh, D because it's incapable of hydrogen bonding. So both alcohols and ethers are actually common products of substitution reaction. So here we have a primary alkyl halide which reacts with a hydroxide via SN2 reaction to form a primary alcohol. Likewise, a primary alkyl halide will undergo SN2 reaction with an alkoxide ion, which is also a strong nucleophile, which results in formation of an ether product. So any preparation of ethers uh, using this method is known as Williamson ether synthesis. Theoretically, there are two different ways to synthesize unsymmetrical ethers via Williamson ether synthesis. One of them is preferred over the other. So here we have two different paths, path A and path B, and we're synthesizing basically the same exact ether here, ethyl isopropyl ether. In path A, we're using a secondary alkyl halide, and in path B, we're using primary alkyl halide. So in path A here, the nucleophile, which is ethoxide ion, attacks this secondary carbon atom, which results in the formation of ethyl isopropyl ether. In path B, we have a different nucleophile here. This is an isopropoxide uh, ion, and this attacks the primary carbon atom, which results in the formation of the same exact ether, ethyl isopropyl ether. However, since primary alkyl halides react much faster compared to secondary or tertiary alkyl halides, path B is preferred. Here's practice problem number 8. Draw the organic product of each reaction. For the first one here, you can see that we have a primary alkyl halide reacting with a strong nucleophile, which is a hydroxide ion. So you would expect an alcohol being synthesized here. So again, this is a substitution uh, reaction in which the hydroxide ion replaces the bromine atom. So let's take a look. So for A here, we have uh, one, two, three, four carbon atoms. And then we, all you have to do is connect the, the four carbon atoms and then replace that bromine atom with the hydroxide. So what we have here is a primary alcohol. And for the second reaction here, we also have a primary alkyl halide reacting with a methoxide ion. So the methoxide ion, the nucleophile, a strong nucleophile, will attack this um, carbon right here, this primary carbon, and then th this results in the um, cleavage of the sigma bond between the carbon and the chlorine atom. So what we have is an ether. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbon atoms. One, two, three, four, five, six. Connect the carbon atoms. And then we have an oxygen CH3. So you can see here that we have an unsymmetrical uh, ether here. And for the third part here, we have, again, a primary alkyl halide reacting with isopropoxide. So this is what an isopropoxide looks like. This is an ion. And so this is a strong uh, nucleophile. And so this strong nucleophile will attack this uh, electron deficient carbon atom here, which results in, again, the cleavage of uh, the sigma bond between the electron deficient carbon atom and the halogen here. And what we have here is another ether. So we have cyclohexane ring. 
and then we have an oxygen right here and the isopropyl group so this is the uh, product of this ether synthesis and for the last one here we have an ethoxide ion attacking this electron deficient carbon atom and then we have the bromine atom which is the Levy group and so what we get here is another ether product In the previous slides, you've seen that ether synthesis requires an alkoxide ion reacting with alkyl halides. And these alkoxides can actually be prepared from alcohols via proton transfer reaction, or Bronsted-Larry acid-base reaction. So for example, we have an alcohol here reacting with an extremely strong base sodium hydride, and this deprotonates the hydrogen from the alcohol, which results in formation of the alkoxide ion which is an extremely strong nucleophile. And this is actually an ideal chemical reaction in the formation of alkoxide nucleophiles because of the fact that the byproduct is a hydrogen gas, which can easily be isolated from the reaction mixture. On the other hand, epoxides can be synthesized via a series of organic chemical reactions involving halohydrins. And halohydrins are organic compounds containing both a hydroxy group and a halogen atom. And this halohydrin will undergo a proton transfer reaction followed by an SN2 reaction which generates this epoxide molecule. So a strong base will deprotonate this hydrogen from the hydroxy group which results in the formation of a negatively charged oxygen which then reacts as a nucleophile and attacks this electron deficient carbon atom resulting in the cleavage of the sigma bond between the carbon and the halogen atom. And what's left is the epoxide molecule. So here's an example. Draw the product of the following two-step reaction sequence. So we have an alcohol here reacting with a strong base and then followed by the second reaction involving an alkyl halide. So the first reaction here is going to be a proton transfer reaction in which the strong base deprotonates this hydrogen which results in the formation of the alkoxide ion. So what we have here is the result of the first reaction. So the first reaction yields an alkoxide ion, which will then act as a nucleophile. And so when you react this with the alkyl halide, this nucleophile will attack the electron deficient carbon atom which results in the cleavage of the sigma bond between the carbon and the bromine atom. And so what we get is an ether. So here's cyclohexane, an oxygen, and an ethyl group, because we have one, two carbon atoms here. So here's practice problem number 10. Draw the products of each reaction. So the first one here, we have a primary alcohol reacting with a strong base. And so this hydrogen will get deprotonated by the strong base, which results in the formation of an alkoxide ion. All right, and for the second one here, we have uh, a strong base reacting with another alcohol. And so this base will react with the hydroxy group, deprotonating this hydrogen. And again, this results in the formation of an alkoxide ion. And this time, the byproduct is going to be ammonia, NH3. And for part C here, we have a series of reactions. So we have the first reaction, which is the generation of the alkoxide ion. And then, um, again, that's a proton transfer reaction. And then once the alkoxide has been generated, this will attack 
the electron deficient carbon atom here via a central reaction. And so we'll, uh, what we have is going to be an ether. So again, we have the protonation first, which results in the formation of the alkoxide ion. And then this will react with the alkyl halide. The sigma bond breaks, and what we have is an ether. So we have one, two, and three carbon atoms. So one, two, and three. For part D, we have another strong base. So the first part is going to be a proton transfer reaction followed by SN2 reaction. So for the proton transfer reaction, we have the hydride ion deprotonating this hydrogen, which results in the formation of the alkoxide ion. So here we have the alkoxide And so this oxygen here will then act as a nucleophile, which will attack this electron deficient carbon atom right here. And this results in the cleavage of the sigma bond between carbon and bromine atom. And so what we have is an epoxide. So now let's look at the general features of alcohols, ethers, and epoxides. When it comes to the leaving group, alcohols don't really have a good leaving group. In fact, the hydroxy group in alcohols is a very poor leaving group. And so alcohols don't typically undergo nucleophilic substitution unless we can convert that hydroxy group into a better leaving group. Unlike the alcohols, the alkyl halides contain halogen atoms, which are considered good leaving groups. So the halide ion is considered a good leaving group because they are weak bases. On the other hand, the hydroxy group in alcohols is considered a poor leaving group because the hydroxide ion is a strong base. So in order to react alcohols via substitution and elimination reactions, we have to convert this hydroxy group into a much better leaving group. And we can do that by protonating this oxygen using strong acids like hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, and some other uh, strong organic acids. And so by protonating this oxygen, we're turning this hydroxy group into water. And water is considered a good leaving group because water is considered a weak base. And so because it is possible to turn this hydroxy group into a much better leaving group, Alcohols can easily be converted into an alkene via elimination reaction and can also be converted into an alkyl halide via nucleophilic substitution reaction. Similar to the alcohols, ethers do not contain a good leaving group, and so they undergo fewer useful reactions compared to the alcohols. I mean, when you look at this chemical structure, this general structure for an ether, you can see that when this comes off, when this part right here comes off, what you have is an alkoxide ion. And as you already know, alkoxide ions are considered very strong bases. And so because of that, they are poor leaving groups. Remember that good leaving groups are weak bases. The epoxides, on the other hand, are a little bit more reactive. And the reason why is because they have this strained three-membered ring, which makes them susceptible to a nucleophilic attack. And a nucleophilic attack results in the opening of this ring, which relieves the angle strain. And we'll talk about uh, the reactions of ethers and epoxides in a little bit more detail towards the end of this uh, chapter. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to focus on the reactions involving alcohols and how we can convert them into alkenes, alkyl halides, and alkyl tosylates. So the first chemical reaction here involving alcohols is called dehydration. 
and we're going to dehydrate an alcohol and convert it to an alkene using two different methods. One is by using acids, strong acids, and the other one is by using phosphorus oxychloride with pyridine. So the first type of chemical reaction that we're going to take a look at involving alcohols is dehydration. And dehydration is actually analogous to dehydrohalogenation, which is a beta elimination type of reaction. The only difference here is instead of removing a hydrogen and a halogen, we're removing a hydroxy group and a hydrogen from the alpha and beta carbon atoms respectively. And so because we're cleaving two sigma bonds here, we're also introducing a pi bond that, that's formed between the alpha and beta carbon atoms. And this is basically the trademark of elimination reactions. Dehydration reactions can be carried out using strong acids. Strong acids such as sulfuric acid and p-toluene sulfonic acid, abbreviated TSOH. So this is the chemical structure of TSOH, which is a strong organic acid. We know this is a strong acid because the pKa is equivalent to negative 7. This is essentially similar in acidity and strength as a hydrochloric acid. So here we have two examples of dehydration elimination reaction involving the removal of a water molecule. So we can use sulfuric acid to remove a water molecule from an alcohol to form or generate an alkene. Same thing over here, we can use toluene sulfonic acid to remove an alcohol or remove a, wa a water molecule from an alcohol and convert it into an alkene. Since dehydration reaction is an example of an elimination reaction, it follows the same trend in terms of reactivity as elimination reaction. And so that means that a tertiary alcohol will react much faster compared to a secondary alcohol or a primary alcohol. So more substituted alcohols dehydrate more easily compared to those that are less substituted. Dehydration elimination reaction is considered regioselective and follows the decisive rule when an alcohol contains more than two beta carbon atoms. And so if you remember from the previous chapters, the more substituted alkene is the major product. Here's an example of a dehydration elimination reaction involving a molecule containing two types of beta carbons. And so because this molecule contains two types of beta carbons, it will generate two different types of alkenes. So one alkene is going to be tri-substituted and the other alkene is di-substituted. And so according to Zaitsev rule, the more substituted alkene is going to be the major product. So in this case, molecule A or alkene A, the tri-substituted one, is going to be the major product. Here's practice problem number 11. Draw the products formed when each alcohol undergoes dehydration with TSOH and label the major product when a mixture results. So for the first molecule here, uh, we have a secondary alcohol. And you can see that the hydroxy group is bonded to this alpha carbon. And any carbon atoms bonded to the alpha carbon will be the beta carbon atoms. And so you can see that both beta carbon atoms are actually identical. They're both uh, secondary uh, carbons. And so in that case, we're only going to have one type of um, product here. So when we react this with TSOH, we're going to have an alkene product. So we're going to have a double bond between the alpha and the beta carbon atoms. So there's going to be a double bond here. And so since we have a double bond here, you can see that we can have two different types of isomers here. So the one that's written here is, or the one that's drawn here is uh, in transposition. So this is trans because this substituent is on the opposite side of the double bond. And so that means that this is going to be the major product. Uh, because of the fact that trans isomers are generally uh, more stable compared to the cis isomers. So you can also draw the uh, other product for this one, but it's going to be a, a minor product. So that would be the cis isomer. And for the second alcohol here, you can see that we have a tertiary alcohol. 
and we have this alpha carbon right over here and you can see that there are three beta carbon atoms we have one two and three these two beta carbon atoms are identical uh, and so we can just label them b1 or beta1 and beta1 and this one is going to be a beta2 and so because we have two different types of beta carbon atoms we're going to have two different types of alkenes and so when you react this with tsoh we're going to have a double bond between beta1 and the alpha carbon atom so that would look something like this like that all right so that's one of the the uh, alkene product and the other one is an alkene in which the double bond is between the alpha carbon atom and the beta 2 carbon atom so all right and according to Zaitsev rule the more substituted alkene is going to be the major product so uh, the first one up top is tri substituted and so you can see that this is going to be the major product and this one at the bottom is going to be the minor product and for the third alcohol here again we have the alpha carbon right over here and then we have a beta carbon here here and here and so when you look at these two beta carbon atoms right here they're actually identical and so we technically only have two different types of beta carbons and so in that case we're going to have two different types of alkene products one it's going to be uh, one of them is going to have a double bond between the alpha carbon and beta 2 carbon so that's one of them and then the other one is going to have a double bond between the alpha carbon and the beta 1 carbon All right. So as you can, so as you can see here, this this alkene here at the bottom is tri substituted, and so this is going to be the major product. And this one up top is going to be the the minor product because it's only di substituted. And here's practice problem number 12. Rank the following alcohols in order of increasing reactivity when dehydrated with sulfuric acid. So we're going to compare the alcohols based on their classification. So the first one over here, we have a primary alcohol. And then the next one is a tertiary alcohol. And then the last one is a secondary alcohol. So we're going to um, rank them based on their classification. And so the tertiary alcohol is going to be the most reactive because they react a lot faster compared to the secondary or the primary alcohol so uh, we can label these a molecule b and molecule c and so in terms of increasing reactivity a is the least reactive followed by c and then b So now let's take a look at the reaction mechanism involving dehydration. And so uh, you learned in a previous chapter that secondary and tertiary alcohols react via E1 mechanism, whereas primary alcohols react via E2 mechanism. And you also remember that E1 and SN1 reactions um, involve a carbocation or the generation of a carbocation, whereas in E2 and SN2 mechanisms, um, it all happens in a single step. So there's no carbocation involved. And so shown here is the mechanism for the dehydration of secondary and tertiary alcohols via E1 mechanism. So you can see that the very first step is the protonation of this oxygen uh, turning the hydroxy group into a good leaving group. And so you have a sulfuric acid reacting with this hydroxy group resulting in the protonation of this oxygen. And so then this water molecule leaves so this bond between the carbon and the oxygen is cleaved and so water is the leaving group and this results in the formation of a carbocation and so now we have the conjugate base hydrogen sulfate that would then react or deprotonate this hydrogen on the beta carbon 
which results in the formation of a pi bond, which is an alkene here. So again, the first part here is the protonation of the oxygen, followed by the formation of a carbocation, and then deprotonation, followed by the formation of the double bond. So here you can see that in the dehydration of secondary and tertiary alcohols, sulfuric acid was used as a starting material or a starting reagent, and then it gets regenerated towards the end of the chemical reaction. So what this means is that sulfuric acid was used as a catalyst or is acting as a catalyst. And so this dehydration of secondary and tertiary alcohols is also known as acid catalyzed dehydration. So one important feature of E1 dehydration of secondary and tertiary alcohols is the fact that we only get a single type of products and those are elimination products. And so we don't get any sort of byproducts coming from an SN1 reaction because there's no competing SN1 reaction in the E1 dehydration of alcohols. And unlike in E1 dehydrohalogenation of alkyl halides, we get a mixture of different products, a mixture of E1 and SN1 products. And so it makes E1 dehydration of secondary and tertiary alcohols much more useful when it comes to synthesizing alkene products. Primary alcohols don't generate carbocations because they are highly unstable. And so they only undergo dehydration via E2 mechanism. So again, primary alcohols undergo dehydration via E2 mechanism. So here's the E2 reaction mechanism for the dehydration of primary alcohols. So you can see here that we have a primary alcohol that gets protonated by the sulfuric acid, which results in the formation of a good leaving group. And this also results in the formation of a conjugate base, which then deprotonates this beta hydrogen, which results in the formation of a pi bond. And you can see that the sulfuric acid was also regenerated uh, at the end of the chemical reaction. So you can see that this is a acid catalyzed uh, reaction. So when we look at the thermodynamics of the dehydration reaction, you can see that entropy actually favors the product formation. You can see that one molecule of the reactant turns into two molecules of the product. On the other hand, enthalpy actually favors reactants. And the reason why is because the overall reaction is endothermic, which suggests that the energy required to break the bonds is greater than the energy released in forming the bonds. According to Le Chatelier's principle, a system at equilibrium will react to counteract any disturbance to the equilibrium. One important benefit of this is that removing a product from a reaction mixture as it is being formed drives the equilibrium to the right, which favors the formation of the product. And so in the dehydration reaction of alcohols, the alkene, which is a product, has a lower boiling point than the starting alcohol. And this alkene product can easily be separated from the reaction mixture by simple distillation. And so this actually drives the equilibrium to the right, which favors the formation of more products. So a lot of organic chemical reactions involving carbocations as reactive intermediates undergo what they call rearrangement. So what it is, is basically a less stable carbocation is converted into a more stable one via either a shift of a hydrogen atom or an alkyl group. So how do we know whether a rearrangement has occurred? Well, during a chemical reaction, there may be a product that's formed with a double bond in a completely unexpected location. Here's an example. So here we have a secondary alcohol that will undergo dehydration reaction via the E1 mechanism. And because this alcohol is undergoing E1 mechanism, a carbocation is going to be generated as the reactive intermediate. So here we have the alpha and the beta carbon atoms. And as you can see, we only have one single beta carbon here. This carbon is not considered a beta carbon because it doesn't have a hydrogen bonded to it. And so you would expect this molecule, this alcohol, to undergo E1 mechanism with only a single product generated. But because the less stable carbocation can be converted into a more stable one via rearrangement, more stable products can be generated as shown here. So there are two different types of carbocation rearrangements. There's the 1-2 hydride shift and the 1-2 alkyl shift. In both cases, the hydrogen atom or the alkyl group migrates or shifts to where the positive charge is. And this generates either an equally stable carbocation or a more stable one. So here's a proposed mechanism for a 1,2 methyl shift carbocation rearrangement during dehydration. 
So this involves two parts. The first part is the formation of a secondary carbocation and rearrangement. The first step is pronation of the hydroxy group, which results in the formation of a better leaving group. And so the sigma bond between the carbon and the oxygen breaks, which results in the formation of a secondary carbocation. The third step is the 1-2 shift, 1-2 methyl shift or 1-2 hydride shift. So in this example here, we have a methyl shift you know, in which the, one of the methyl groups migrates or shifts to where this positive charge is, which results in the formation of a tertiary carbocation, which is the more stable carbocation. And the second part here involves the loss of a proton to form the pi bond. So because of the carbocation rearrangement, we now have two different types of beta carbons. We have beta 1 and beta 2. And because we have two different types of beta carbon atoms, we're going to have two different types of alkene products. Uh, one alkene product will have the double bond between the beta 1 and the alpha carbon atom. And then the other alkene product will have the double bond between the beta 2 and the alpha carbon atoms. So the 1-2 hydride shifts are actually very similar to the 1-2 metal shifts. The only difference is that uh, hydrogen is involved instead of a methyl. And so they have the same goal here. A 1-2 shift or a 1-2 hydride shift basically converts a less stable carbocation into a more stable one. And so um, one other thing that you might want to remember regarding hydride shifts and metal shifts is that these carbocation rearrangements are not unique to dehydration reactions. As long as there's a carbocation involved, there's going to be a rearrangement uh, possible. And so it's all, this is also possible for SN1 mechanisms, substitution uh, reactions. And so here's an example here. We have a secondary carbocation in which the hydrogen migrates or shifts towards this carbon uh, bearing the positive charge. And so what we now have is a tertiary carbocation, which is the more stable carbocation. This uh, molecule or this carbocation here labeled B is already a tertiary carbocation, so there's not going to be any rearrangement involved here. So here's an example. Show how the dehydration of alcohol X forms alkene Y using a 1-2 hydride shift. So the very first step here is the pronation of the oxygen by this sulfuric acid, which results in the conversion of a bad leaving group into a much better leaving group. And so you can see that uh, the sigma bond breaks between the carbon atom and the oxygen atom, uh, which results in the formation of a secondary carbocation. And the third step here is the 1-2 hydride shift. So you can see this hydrogen that's bonded to a tertiary carbon atom will migrate and shift towards this carbon bearing the positive charge. And so now what we have is a tertiary carbocation, which is the more stable one. And then the fourth step is the deprotonation of a hydrogen that's bonded to a beta carbon. And so now what we have is the formation of a pi bond or a double bond between the uh, beta carbon and this carbon bearing the positive charge. Here's practice problem number 15. Explain why two substitution products are formed in the following reaction. So here you can see that we have a secondary alkyl halide. So we can go ahead and write this down. We have a secondary alkyl halide and we have a weak nucleophile. So this is a weak nucleophile. All right, and so because this is a secondary alkyl halide, um, this sigma bond breaks between the secondary carbon atom and the chlorine atom. And so this basically generates a secondary carbocation. All right, and so notice that we have a hydrogen here that's bonded to this tertiary carbon atom. And so there's a high probability that we're going to have a hydride shift here because of this hydrogen atom. And so, so that means that we can also have a tertiary carbon or tertiary carbocation here. And so now if you were to react this secondary carbocation with a weak nucleophile, this is what we get. So we have this attack right here, or another possibility is with this tertiary carbocation right here. 
All right, so we're going to have two possibilities here, two different products. So uh, we can have a secondary alcohol. And then the other one is a tertiary alcohol. All right, so uh, the chloride ion, which acts as a conjugate base, will deprotonate the this uh, these hydrogens here. So we have the chloride ion. All right, we have chloride ion here as well. And these chloride ions will act as a base, which will then deprotonate these hydrogen atoms right here. And so what we get are these two products of a substitution reaction.